Hi, welcome to the ISERI X E20 Football Foundation session with Matt Earlfield. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm now going to introduce Matt. And, but before I do, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Silman, who is the head coach and founder of E20 Football Foundation. Thanks again for welcoming me to, to this event as well. And I hope there's many other E20 members that will be able to view this. I think what you're doing, Musa, with all of these sessions, um, bringing in authors from many fantastic books for, for lots of young children to read is a, an amazing thing. And I, I really want to say thank you for that. Um, these particular books I'm really interested in because my, my two sons, um, every time they go to a bookstore, they pick out this series um, of football books. And they really enjoy the fact that they get to, to choose their favourite football players um, who play for their teams or even ones that they're just interested in that, how they made made it into becoming a professional football player. And I think these these books really capture that information. So I'm really excited to, to listen to the webinar just as my children are in the other room. Hello, how you doing? I'm good, thank you. How about you? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, should I wait? Let me turn a light on. Coming, Matt. It's, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. Um, no, well, thank you very much for organising all of this. It's amazing. I'm so impressed by what you're doing. Seriously. Oh, thank you very much. Um, thank you. So basically, um, I write these books with my brother Tom, um, who lives in Canada, which is why he's not here on the call too. Um, but he says hi to to everyone. Um, but basically, um, these are, they're the biographies of these famous footballers, all of the, the big heroes of today, and also some of the sort of classic heroes as well, people like Maradona and Beckham and these kind of people. Um, and it's all about telling their life story, their journey, but trying to make it interesting. And as much as possible, we're trying to make it relatable. So we want these kids to, you know, to really see what um you know what it was like growing up for some of these for these footballers and the kind of challenges that they have to come overcome along the way um and yeah all of all of that so sort of the life lessons that we can throw in there as well as all the fun and the, the football so i've got to ask um i mean yeah. what exactly inspired you to right because it's not it's not exactly it's you writing about other players so what exactly made you want to do that um i think one of the main things was that when we were growing up, my brother and I, we, we loved football. And we actually happened to already, well, I in particular like reading already, but for my brother, there weren't really the kind of fun, you know, these kind of fun football books for kids, especially ones that were about the heroes um, and their stories. They just weren't books like that available. And so one of those, yeah, one of the things that we really wanted to do was write the kind of books that, just weren't around, but we would have really enjoyed when we were that age. How much time goes into, because obviously you have to have that element of, it's a biography, so you have to make sure you know the football player's history and everything. How much time goes into that research aspect, I say? Yeah, I'm, I mean, now that we've done so many, I think we're on about 40 something. So like we, we've kind of got a routine going. We know what we're doing. Um, which makes it a lot easier. But yeah, we do still need to do tons of research. And at first, I can remember it taking, you know, months of time, just trying to trying to work out the, the key moments, trying to make sure that, because obviously we, we don't get the chance, sadly, to meet or speak to these players. So we need to get these things right. Otherwise, we're going to be in big trouble from these very famous, very wealthy people. Um, so <laughs> we have to know what we're doing. Um, and I can remember, yeah, we used to spend months going through, you know, videos, through newspapers, magazines, books, just trying to bring together all this information. Whereas now, I think because we've been doing it for a while, we know where to go. We know what we're doing a bit more so we can kind of make it a bit faster. But it's still probably, I'd say it takes as much time as the writing. Yeah. Oh, wow. OK, so it's, it's not necessarily a... You so how how does it actually work? Do you meet them, or is it do you just pure, is it purely just researching it? Uh, yeah, being, it's um, sadly we don't get to meet. Yeah, we don't get to meet them. So it's so it is very much about research um, and and just finding as much as you can from as many different places because you want to tell. It's not just that you want to tell, you know, 
everything about them, but you want to find mm. stuff really interesting as well. So as well as the uh, Heroes books, I did a book, uh, this book called Unbelievable Football, which is all about, again, which is non-fiction. This is all about kind of weird and wonderful tales from football history. So you've got animals and people pretending to die and all kinds of stuff. It's very, and, and then this one is very much fiction. So this is all about um, a fictional character, a young boy who is, he loves football, but isn't actually that good at playing football, but it turns out that he's got this incredible football brain, which he uses to become a top, top manager. I'm going to have to put on some voices and stuff. I'm sorry. I can only apologise if this doesn't go well. <laughs> no, I'm sure, I'm sure we'll be fine. So, Johnny Ball, assistant manager. It sounded super cool, but what did it mean? What did an assistant manager actually do? I'm pretty sure Tisbury Primary hadn't had one for previous county cups, ever. What had I got myself into? At first, I made the mistake of listening to people at school. Great, Johnny will be washing our dirty, stinking kits every week, I heard Alex C shouting from the other side of the lunch hall. Most of the time, Alex C just repeated Billy the Bully's jokes like a human-sized parrot, but sometimes he tried to make people laugh by himself. Billy didn't look that impressed, mainly because he hadn't thought of it himself. Now he had to think of something even funnier. Yeah, and you could do with it. We could do with a ball boy too. Billy yelled, and of course everyone laughed. Everyone except me. No way was I signing up for running around after Billy. I thought Tavia, my best friend, might have some better ideas, but hers were just as bad. Maybe the assistant manager drives the team bus, she suggested. What? I can't drive a bus. I'm only nine years old. Yeah, that could be a problem, she said, slowly slurping her slimy custard. Okay, maybe the assistant manager puts up the cones and hands out the water bottles. You're old enough to do that, right? Yeah, but that sounds super boring. Well, sorry, monkey mouth. No, they were all wrong, I decided. As a football player, I was good, but not that good. Now that I had accidentally become a football assistant manager, I was going to be great. I would use all my football genius ideas to make my family proud of me. I was going to lead Tisbury Primary to County Cup glory and become the next Paul Porterfield. Paul Porterfield had started out as the Tisbury Town assistant manager, and now he's the manager and probably the best manager in the whole wide world. It isn't just my dad who says that, I promise. Thanks to him, our local team has won almost as many trophies as my brother Daniel. In fact, I was hoping that my big brother might be able to answer my question. And it was a good chance to talk to him. When we were younger, Daniel and I used to do everything together. And now that he was in year nine, he didn't have time to hang out with me so much. Actually, he didn't have time to hang out with me at all. But there was one thing that could get Daniel talking. It was football. After school that day, I waited ages for my brother to get home so I could ask him all about assistant managers. When he finally arrived, he stormed straight upstairs without even taking his headphones out. Nice to see you too, Daniel, I said out loud, but only because I knew that he couldn't hear me. I counted to 50 and then decided to be brave. Hello, I called out, knocking on his bedroom door. These days, my brother has rules. Yeah, what's up? He called out. That was the sign that it was safe to enter. In the sunlight, Daniel's room sparkled like a pirate's treasure chest. There were trophies everywhere. Gold, silver, bronze, big, medium, small, tournament cups, league titles, player of the year awards. If Daniel hadn't been a pretty good brother once upon a time, I would really hate his talented football guts. Once he'd picked a few football magazines off the bed, there was space for me to sit down and share my news. Hey, I didn't make the school team. Oh, that's savage. Sorry, bro. But I'm the assistant manager instead. That's swipe. Classy, bro. I didn't really understand my brother's new cool kid talk, but of course I pretended I did. Yeah, classy, bro. Anyway, what does an assistant manager do? No clue, Daniel said with his new cool kid shrug. Whatever you want, I guess. I tried to copy Daniel's cool kid shrug, but I think it looked more like a bad dad dance. Luckily, he ignored it and kept talking. Is macho man still the manager? That's what we used to call him. He's so hench, it's unreal. You know what I mean? The guy knows nothing about football, though. Nothing. You know your stuff, bro, so maybe you could teach him a thing or two. Yeah, cool, mates, I said as a smile spread across my face. 
suddenly I couldn't wait to be the assistant manager. Spoiler alert. Sorry, I should <laughs> still read the book though. Still read the book. No, yes, I mean it's 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 relatively new though, isn't it? I mean, how was how was working on that? It was really fun and very different. Um so it was with a different completely different publisher and um yeah, just working working on fiction is just so so different and um I always I feel like a lot more attached to f fiction books because you know I don't know it's all my own ideas I'm not basing it on anything it's all mine so then you know if an editor says to me oh we want to we don't think this bit's quite right let's change this I'm just like no 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 I need that like that's mine don't take it um so there's a bit more of that um but it's been really fun and I've learned loads from um way more than I kind of ever thought I would um, from, from writing something totally different. Um, what is your favourite football, football heroes book? Or what's football heroes? Um, oof. Well, so the, the, the ones I've got here, because there's so many of them now that I can't, <laughs> I can never keep hold of all of them. Um, but the ones I've got here are um, Mbappe, Salah, Mane, Ronaldo, Messi. Um, I guess my favourite of those would probably be Sadio Mane, partly, partly because I'm a, I'm a Southampton fan. So, oh, okay. <laughs> I, you know, once upon a time, he was good to us. Uh, growing <laughs> up, Sadio's favourite football teams were Marseille and Barcelona. But he always watched the Champions League final, no matter who was playing. He had to. It was the biggest game of the year. In 2005, the final was Liverpool versus AC Milan in Istanbul. Sadio crowded around the TV in Bambali with his friend Yusuf. We're definitely going to win this, Yusuf declared confidently before kickoff. We was Liverpool. That's because after Super Senegal's wonderful World Cup 2002, the club had signed their star player, El Hajj Diouf. Sadly, Diouf had been unsuccessful at Liverpool, but Yusuf still supported them anyway. I think it'll be 2-1. No, maybe 3-1 to the Reds. Sadio wasn't so sure about his friend's prediction. Milan had an amazing team with world-class footballers in every position. Cafu and Paolo Maldini in defence, Clarence Seydorf and Kakar in midfield, and Andrei Shevchenko and Hernan Crespo in attack. If they played well, they could destroy a team like Liverpool. And in the first half, that's exactly what happened. Maldini volleyed home Andrea Pirlo's free kick, 1-0. Shevchenko crossed to Crespo, 2-0. Kakar played the perfect pass to send Crespo through, 3-0. The frown got deeper and deeper on Yusuf's face until at half-time he'd had enough. I can't watch any more of this. I'm going home. No, stay, Sadio tried to persuade him. You never know what might happen. But it was no use. Yusuf walked off in a sulk, and so Sadio had to watch the sensational second half all on his own. First, Steven Gerrard scored a powerful leaping header, 3-1. Then, Vladimir Smitsa went for a dipping long-range shot, and the ball squirmed under Dida's arms and into the bottom corner. 3-2. Whoa, Liverpool couldn't. Could they? Sadio couldn't believe what he was seeing. Should he go and tell Yusuf the good news? No, because then he might miss more goals. Sadio stayed. That turned out to be the right decision because three minutes later, Gerard burst into the box and just as he was about to shoot, Gennaro Gattuso fouled him. Penalty! Sadio screamed at the TV. It was like the referee could hear him because he pointed to the spot straight away. It was Xabi Alonso who stepped up to take it for Liverpool. What a massive moment. Sadio felt really nervous and he was only watching. Imagine what it would feel like to actually play in a Champions League final. The boy from Bambali dared to dream. One day, Sadio told himself excitedly, one day. Dida dived down low to save Alonso's penalty, but the Spaniard slid in to score the rebound. 3-3! Three, three. This is crazy! Sadio said to himself with a smile. It was the most dramatic football match he had ever seen, and he didn't want it to end. After 30 more minutes of tense extra time, the 2005 Champions League final went all the way to penalties. By then, Sadio was definitely supporting Liverpool. Someone has asked, uh, we have 
So someone has asked, who, who had the most interesting story? I think a, a couple of people have asked this question. Would you say it's Mane then? Or? Um, Mane was really good. Salas is really good. Um, I just, I, I, you know, writing these books is just way more interesting to write about players who have had this incredible journey, who maybe come from quite a, an underprivileged background where, you know, the idea of playing, becoming a Premier League superstar is just beyond your wildest dreams. Um, and then they've managed to go all the way. So in the same way, Sergio Aguero would be a good one as well. Um, I just find those stories a lot more fascinating than, you know. Matt, it was an absolute was pleasure having you. <laughs> you. You were great. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, pleasure.